So we will call the meeting to order at 5.03 p.m. Welcome everyone to the Deerfield School Committee meeting. This meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and um, is also being recorded for to just to alert everyone. And uh, it is an, a remote meeting um, and we will move to the agenda. The first item on the agenda is review and approve the minutes of October 6, 2020. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Trevor moves to approve. Second. Was that, was that Carrie? Yes. And any notations, edits, changes? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Kenneth Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Trevor McDaniel? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It is unanimous. Uh, financial statement and uh, warrants. So if we will turn this over to Sh Mrs. Pareda. Thank you. Uh, so I emailed out the financial statement and then the general fund and school choice reports through October 31st. Uh, you all reviewed 23 warrants totaling $209,772.47 since the last meeting. Um, I'm not concerned tonight about the general fund expense accounts. Um, we still have some savings from positions that were not filled. However, I am keeping an eye on a few lines, um, general repairs for buildings, general repairs, and then wages for IAs and nurses. Um, the HVAC updates in particular and repairs and the school also just had an issue where um, part of the system was impacted from the power outage of that storm a few weeks back. And so we've had some additional expenses in buildings general repairs that we wouldn't normally have. Some of those JAMROG HVAC expenses are gonna get paid from grant funding or Municipal CARES Act funding from the town. Um, however, I don't believe we have enough to pay for all of that. And this additional expense on top of it, I believe it was a $2,500 bill um, we checked with insurance and the deductible for the town is 5,000. So it didn't make sense obviously to put in a claim, but that is an additional expense we have. Um, and then with the IAs and the nurse wages, so there were some negotiated additional hours of pay for IAs depending on their duties with the MOA. Um, so we're just trying to calculate what that will be through the rest of the year. It might push us over in some of our IA lines. And then the nursing wages has to do with, um, I think Darius had explained at the last meeting or the meeting before that Meg Birch was moved from the part-time nurse leader position, part-time Conway nurse to full-time nurse leader given COVID crisis. Um, she's really working around the clock for us to make sure that faculty, staff and students are safe and families are informed. So. Um, unfortunately, that means that there is a larger expense to each of the elementary schools because her salary is now split several ways. Um, and it's not her full salary because she is primarily grant funded. I know that's a lot of information. I'm just trying to explain mm -hmm. so everybody mm -hmm. understands. Um, so a portion of her salary gets paid between the five schools and some of that is Deerfield. So, you know, just things that I'm keeping an eye on. And as I said, I do expect that the general fund has some savings from positions that Tina has not filled and will not fill for this year. Um, so we're certainly not having concern there, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them about those reports before I keep going or what I just commented on before I keep going. I, I don't think, I don't have any questions on what you just reported on. No. Great. I'm good. Um, so we have also been talking month to month since the summer about the school lunch program uh, and I'm finally able to give you a more concrete update now that students have been in the building for the full month of October. Um, October is a good baseline for us because even though there is a holiday in there for Columbus Day, it's one of the days, or it's one of the months of the year that has the most student in person days. So I believe there were 21 or 22 days in October. So it's a good baseline for the school lunch program to project out what our possible 
uh, revenue will be in this program. And we have served about 200 breakfasts and 2,000 lunches to date. That's not just October. Um, that does include numbers from September when students were in for about half the month and also some from August before we had a couple weeks shut down. Um, so I did give you a year-to-date snapshot here on this report. Our revenue is just shy of $7,000 to date. Total expenditures are just over 13,000. So we're looking at a net income year-to-date of 6,500 in the negative. Um, and that 13,000 includes food costs, supply costs, and wages. Um, so again, this is something that we've been talking about for months. We knew that we were gonna be in this position where we likely would not be bringing in enough revenue to cover wages in particular. Um, we are covering, covering food and supply costs at this point and putting a little bit towards the good, um, but we really need to make a decision to move the wages off of the general fund, I mean, I'm sorry, off of the school lunch revolving fund and onto the general fund. So I'd like to make that recommendation tonight. Um, there is a balance in the school lunch account of just over 19,000. And that is after that $6,500 loss that we've had year to date. Um, so we still have some money, but I really don't think we wanna run that account completely dry. Um, if you guys wanted to push it a bit, we could certainly pay some additional wages out of there, but it would be my recommendation to leave that account as it is, continue monitoring and move the wages off. Do we, do we have any, I'm sorry, this is Trevor, do we have any idea what the wages would be for the year? Yeah, let me pull up another report. I want to say it's around 52,000, mm -hmm. um, but don't quote me yet. I can yeah. easily pull it up and take a quick look. So with that, I, I do believe that the general fund can support that. As I said, Tina does have savings from two significant positions. There were two teacher salary positions that were not refilled for this year. There's mm -hmm. still you know, money's in there as a placeholder because their positions we're gonna have to consider refilling. But for this year, given the educational model, she was able to kind of manipulate things. And so we had savings. So we can afford to make this change. Um, it will eat up a good chunk of what we have yeah. saved up. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. We have wages of 56,000 roughly for school lunch. Um, and I did talk to Mary, our food service director, about what people are working, you know, because service isn't exactly the same um, as it was in prior years. And actually, she said at the elementary schools, the team leads are working a little bit more than they normally would because there's some additional things that are going into this with having to prep all of the meals to be delivered to the classrooms. Mm -hmm. So it's not been a completely seamless transition as far as um, that goes and you know they're adjusting I think things are going well as far as I know but you know where you might think that there's some savings because you know not all the kids are in the building at the same time and we had that short month in September um, they're still working just as hard as they would if not harder in any well, other year we're feeling that everywhere yeah okay um, any other questions for Shelly, um, if if we don't have any other questions, I think I'd entertain a motion or I'd like to see if we could entertain a motion to move the school lunch wages from the school revolving fund to the general fund for the fiscal 2021 school year. Can I just ask one question? Just like what's, sure. the, what's the sort of practical reason or benefit for this? I mean, is it just so that that, because you're expecting the revolving fund to run out of money? Right. Right. We And we can't run the account in the negative. So uh, we could wait and run the account in the negative for the rest of the year. And then at the end of the year, make a transfer once we know what the actual wages are. Um, but, you know, either way, we're going to have to move them at some point. Okay. Even okay, even though the isn't isn't, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor it because I'm not sure it's a big deal. But it sounds like the revenue model that you've got here is it's not like we're going to lose six thousand dollars every two months because September was kind of a an aberration compared with what's going to happen going forward, right? Our our revenue year to date is only sixty seven thousand or sixty seven hundred. 
and we already have 1300 in expenses you know we're already looking at our revenue that counts august september october so if i project out for the next you know say eight months um we're not going to make enough to continue to cover wages right now we have some surplus to do that mm -hmm. But we'll yeah. likely only be able to cover our um, food and supply costs, not our salaries. You know, if I look at even if if we counted sixty seven hundred dollars a month for revenue over ten months, that's sixty thousand. <coughs> Wages are fifty six alone before we um, pay for food and supplies. So you know, it's just the math doesn't work out. And this is, this is yeah. Trevor. This is just an. Uh, uh, because not a lot of kids are buying lunch right now, right? Is that the idea? We just don't have the revenue coming in to support the program. Right. And th so the, even the kids, I mean, 2000 lunches, I think, you know, I, I'd have to look and ask Mary what they used to do, but it sounds like a large number. Um, yeah. But I think what the difference is, is there, because it's every, free for everyone, the state subsidy amount is not as much as a regular paying person, right. you know, student yeah. would pay. Yep. Um, you know, there's there's no like a la carte choices, you know, they're not buying anything extra like that either. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, okay. and, and so it, it I think that what we have is a pretty realistic snapshot of what the future is going to look like at this point for this year. Um, and we know it's yeah, free through year. June. So, you know, I think it makes most sense for us to make this move. And then what we can do at the end of the year, well, we're not going to be able to wait that long, but when we start budget planning, you know, we'll see what we can save up in a little bit of surplus to help support next year, because we know that next year is going to be equally hard, if not harder. So we'll mm -hmm. have some tough decisions to make. Okay. Um, sure. So you were entertaining a motion, right, Ken? Uh, I'd make that motion. I was entertaining a motion to move the lunch wages from the revolving the lunch school lunch revolving fund to the general fund for the 2021 uh, school year. So make that motion, Trevor. Trevor, okay. Do we have a second? Second, Terry. Okay. Any more questions or thoughts? Uh, hearing none, a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Trevor McDaniel? Yes. It's unanimous, it carries. And you would like to continue, Shelley? Yes, I have a couple more things. Um, so the next piece uh, we may come back to and talk further when we get into this on the agenda because it does coincide with that, but I'll give you an update here while we're talking about um, financials. So phase three of the hybrid planning um, is something that will be discussed today of the reopening plan. Um, and Tina Darius and I did have a conversation of what that looks like for Deerfield financially based on the plan that um, the administration is developing with the teaching staff. Um, and we do need additional staffing in order to carry through with this plan. Um, we're looking to move a reading interventionist position who is currently 0.8 FTE to one full-time equivalent. Um, it's a salary increase of roughly $10,000 through the rest of this school year. Um, again, I think we can add this to the general fund. It is already a general fund budgeted position, so we're increasing. Um, Tina and I did talk about that this would be for this year only and reconsider going into next year's budget. Um, we would drop it back down to 0.8 as a starting point. Um, we have savings, again, in the general fund to do that, and it feels appropriate to place the rest of that salary there. Uh, the most addition, Another additional expense that's most costly is the addition of four new instructional assistants. Um, again, short-term temporary positions that we'd be looking to add only for this year, um, wiping them off when we start talking about FY22 budgeted. Um, it's an expense of roughly $55,000 through the rest of this year. Um, and I'm making a recommendation that we use school choice funds to cover these temporary one-year positions. Um, we are eating into the surplus with the school lunch uh, wages, which we don't have a choice but to do. We can't run that account in the negative. Um, we need the reading interventionists. We will have a little bit of money left in my um, cushion that I'm kind of protecting through the rest of the year for unforeseen expenditures. 
Um, and really with school choice, I did give you a snapshot here. Um, the projected expenditures that I added in, uh, that 55,000, it also has some COVID related expenses that we're gonna back out once we get reimbursement from the town. Um, I also think revenue is projected a little bit low in this snapshot uh, because we do have some special education increment claims that we're gonna receive additional funding for that we did not include in the original budget for school choice. Um, so, you know, I think we're still in a healthy position at the end of the year. I am projecting over 800,000 still left in school choice to support further budgeting. And, you know, really that's what this rainy day fund that Deerfield has been so good about making sure that we reserve for circumstances like we're in, you know, these one-time positions that we're not going to add permanently to the budget. It really makes sense to fund it from this source. Um, I, I just had a question because there's, you know, there's a lot going on outside of school choice here. The, the school choice snapshot that you've presented here, does that include the 55,000 for the four IAs? It does. I wanted okay. you to see what the number was at, right. after we paid for this. Yep. Yes, no, I, I understand that. And then, then you go into um, the COVID expense updates and the grants and the Municipal Cares Act funding and all of the, the money that's sort of moving around from pillar to post right now. Um, and it, it sounds like there's there's some money coming back into either the general fund or uh, available to the school in some capacity for, for other expenses related to COVID as we move forward. But, um, you know, I just wanted to have your rationale for using school choice at this point in time instead of maybe some of these other monies that are coming back. So is it, is it possible for you to sort of lay that out for us? Muted. I was just pulling up the COVID spreadsheet so that I can let you know exactly what's going to go back into the school choice fund. Um, okay. So right now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the COVID expenditures as a whole. So the town of Deerfield has graciously awarded us a grant of 181,000 from their Municipal Cares Act funding. Um, so as a result, Deerfield Elementary will receive 95,000 in reimbursement for items related to PPE, cleaning, school distance learning, and social distancing. Additionally, we'll be able to purchase $86,000 worth of new items, which is primarily technology related to further support the social school distance learning. Um, so of that 95,000, um, a smaller amount is going back into general fund. We really tried not to use general funds. Only about 10,000 will get reimbursed for general fund use. Mm -hmm. um, and then from school choice so far, we've paid for, let's see, that's not in there yet because that's still pending. Just a rough number is yeah about sure. about thirty thousand so far from school choice will get reimbursed, okay. um, and then you know there's some other funding sources that yeah. I have to factor in as well. So you know in a way we're sort of swapping out the COVID expenditures for the IAs. I mean that's certainly right. one way we could look at. I it. mean, in essence, that that thirty thousand you just talked about is not part of your projection in the 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 quick snapshot up above, right? I left it in the 520,000 because I'm still working right. with my team to yep. um, map out where exactly all that money goes when we get it back from the town. So I didn't want to pull it out and give you a number that wasn't real today. Sure. So yep. once we add that back in, it will add to the balance at the end of the year. Right. I, I, I've, I understand. I just wanted to make sure that the committee is clear on that and we're all clear on that um Absolutely. that uh you know this is your conservative number at this point in time of what the impact would be for these four positions so That's i correct. appreciate it thank you no thank you for taking the time to explain it absolutely could i ask about um the the need so so you have a need for four and um it kind of wasn't anticipated earlier when you're building your model and you're thinking this is what you need. Can you just speak to that? You know, what, what have you found for needs and why do you think you need four? And okay, so can, I, can I jump in right there? So it's sure. on the agenda that we're going to talk about it. Should oh, 
ahead to talk about it, the financial thing. So Tina's oh, going to lay out. Wait. Tina's yeah. going to lay out what the planning is at this point. Then in there is the staffing. We I think we got a little ahead talking okay. about asking for money around staffing. Yep. It's connected to money, but you you'll see the need. Later on. And you'll, then you'll decide if the need is justified and then the money should be used. I think it's kind of, right. I think you should probably go in that order. Sounds good. Uh, right. And then we can take a vote later on. Okay. Very good. Okay. Sorry to interrupt again. Go ahead, no, Shelly. Okay. We're sort of bouncing around a little bit. Um, so most of the COVID grant money at this point is spent. Uh, Tina and I are in conversation about spending the last of the money that the school received directly from DESE. Um, that was, as just a reminder, about 96,000 that the school received directly, not the town funding. So we've just about spent that up. Um, and then the only other thing to comment on uh, two pieces, um, the FY22 budget planning, you know, we have heard from some towns, although not Deerfield yet, of what their calendar looks like for the budget planning process at the town level. Um, Deerfield has not requested any information, but we are beginning to think about all of these different components that will go into building next year's budget, given the uncertainty. You know, we don't even have a budget for this year yet from the state. Um, which is my final comment that is not on my report, Darius, and I just had a conversation about this today. Um, because the House did release their preliminary budget um, and they updated the cherry sheets and they are supporting the governor's most recent update to level fund chapter 70. So I took a closer look at that today. And of course, you know, we don't know until everything is finalized. But right now that would look like a loss of chapter 70 revenue of almost $10,000 for the town of Deerfield. Um, so that's just something to have on our minds. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the select board will want to do about that, if anything. Um, and Darius and I did talk about having a four town admin meeting so that we could sort of lay out what we're seeing at this point. Um, but we will have to wait and see if the town wants us to take any action on that loss of their local revenue. Okay. All right, Sorry. thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Any sure, other no questions? Problem. Sorry for getting ahead there. Oh, no, no, I we, le we led you ahead. Any other questions for, for Shelley? <laughs> <clears throat> um, hearing none, uh, we would move to public comment. And this evening, we do have a public comment. Jennifer Smith has joined us. Uh, she had written a, a statement that she, I believe, would like to read into the record, as opposed to me reading it. Um, and I welcome, Jennifer. You can unmute and go. I didn't know I had the option that you could read it, so. But I'll go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. We, we enjoy having you join us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Jennifer Smith. As many of you know, I'm a fourth grade teacher at Deerfield Elementary School. Um, after the events in the world and after hearing from over 200 alumni of Frontier, the district began work over the summer to develop a task force, an anti-racism and equity committee. In addition to the committee, the district committee, I worked with a small group of elementary teachers to develop a 10 week long professional development series for our elementary staff and faculty. We worked closely with the district consultant, Amanda Mosea, to have district wide workshops, pre and post reflection data, and small groups doing pathways of study for, approxim for the, our approximately 200 staff and faculty. We're about to complete our first 10 weeks where we have dived deep into the history of racism in this country and the development of identities and white privilege. We're doing this work in order to know how to address biases, stereotypes, and well-intentioned but nevertheless problematic messages that we're sending to all of our students. Through this work, we'll be able to developmentally and appropriately confront, challenge, and work to undo systemic racism that's prevalent in our schools. These topics come up at all levels and teachers need to be trained and prepared to guide their students through it. I just wanted to express my great appreciation to Darius for the large amount of time for teachers to do the personal work required to become comfortable and skilled in this area. I know that the school committee members would agree that this is important work that must be supported and required for all staff, faculty, and administrators. 
so that our families and students of color begin to feel heard and prioritized in our community. I'm excited to continue the work in the elementary schools through the winter, and I'm looking, looking forward to hearing what the administrators are working on to become leaders on this front. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, it was very well written, and I, I can't begin to imagine how much time you've had to invest in this process. Uh, this is just, I mean, it's its so necessary. Um, so thank you so much for, for your work and the committee. And please extend our thanks to the committee as well. So, and I see Kelsey just joined us. <laughs> so um, practically have the whole team here. <laughs> uh, that would do it for our public comment section. And uh, we would move on from there to unfinished business. Jennifer, if you want to stick around for the rest of the meeting, feel free. If not, we'll fully understand. You've got, got your kids to get to. So <clears throat> um, anti-racism and equity committee update. Is that going to be Darius, Kelsey, who? <laughs> Give a, 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 just a wonderful <laughs> update please tonight. Um, so Kelsey's going to give an update on how things are going, and I'm also going to give a quick overview of what the administration's putting together for their profession. Okay. So Kelsey, you can go first. Sure. Um, so I believe our last school committee meeting was just before the screening of the documentary and then the launch at um, Frontier Regional. So we know that there was an, an incident with um, comments during the film screening. We had some seventh graders who started out with just silly comments and that progressed to uh, very racist and um, not okay comments. So there was follow up at the school the next day with those students. Um, the seventh grade class got to discuss um, how those comments made them feel. Um, so their classmates were kind of able to hear the impact that that had had on their, on their fellow students. Um, and then of course, Scott followed up with those students and their families um, with discipline. For the rest of the student body that day, um, Amanda Mosea was providing an affinity space for our students of color. So they had, um, they had support and a place to go if they chose to. Um, the rest of the students watched a film that we had put together that was some announcements and some education about what we're doing. Um, that had to do with ending the N-word, um, changing the school logo, um, and then also just sort of defining anti-racism and talking about why we're doing it. Um, so after that, our students took a survey um, and about a little over 60% of them consistently responded positively to that survey. And then about 30 or so percent of them were sort of like on the fence in between, a little confused. Um, but overall, it was a positive response from our students. Um, so that was encouraging. For on November 3rd, we just had our first full day PD for anti-racism. Um, so the morning the high school was working with um, the Radical Empathy Consulting Group out of UMass. And then in the afternoon, it was a full district PD. Um, and we had several offerings that were available um, to the teachers and staff. Um, one of them was Dr. Pryor speaking about use of the N-word. Um, Amanda gave one talking about um, dealing with pushback from parents who were concerned about bringing this curriculum into the schools. Um, so the elementary schools are nearing the end of their first PD series and the high school is just starting to kind of launch into theirs. So November 3rd was the kickoff um, with the consulting group out of UMass. So we have five more sessions lined up with them. So we'll hopefully be catching up to the, the elementary schools. Um, the peer leadership group at the high school just had their second meeting and they're, they're really, they're really excited and they're really interested in figuring out how they can start having these conversations outside of that group and with, um, with their classes, even with the elementary schools and what might that look like during COVID? How can we move forward with that? Um, so that is continuing to, to happen and we're continuing to kind of brainstorm about what that might look like. Um, the eighth grade just launched their ELA and social studies curriculum that's going to be using Stamped, which we're very excited about. 
Um, and then on Thursday, I'm going to be attending the FERCOG meeting, um, and hopefully we'll have an update on the advancing anti-racism in schools assessment that they're going to be doing for us. Okay. Very, thank you very much. That's great. No and great progress. Amazing amount of work being done there as well. Mm -hmm. So Darius, you wanted to follow up? Sure do. Um, so uh, in in conjunction with what the staff was doing, um, they were, the PD were providing for staff at both elementary and secondary, the kind of administration kind of fell in between both. We were, we were catching parts of and then find ourselves getting pulled away. It seems that crises always seem to happen during a PD session. Um, and at the same time, I was trying to trying to look for PD that leaders need to help lead through this um, through these types of uh, change and um, how do you leave an institution through anti-racism, um, you know, kind of thing, uh, trainings and such. So I have a quick, a quick P, uh, PowerPoint just to kind of mix it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where the heck is it? Present now. There we go. And so um, I did share this with all the school community members. So if you want to go, if I go too quickly, um, you can um, read through it later. But basically, you know, started with our just putting our district anti-racism equity mission out there. I'm not going to read it for you, but you know, just kind of reading through, um, you know, what our what our what our mission is as a district and our district goals, and talking about those four pillars. Um, you know that I know Kelsey talked about. I believe it was Kelsey at this meeting that talked about it prior that the anti-racism uh, committee has subcommittees working on. Um, our professional development goal this year for the, you know, for the for all faculty and us is to have a expand our knowledge of history of racism in this country, to better understand our own um, present context, to reflect in our own identities and how they affect how we lead, teach, problem solve, and communicate, um, and identify how systemic racism impact our schools, communities, and personalize and use this knowledge to make effective change. And so really, you know, this year is getting comfortable, being comfortable, and it's and it's also occurring with administration, you know, getting comfortable about use of vocabulary, um, getting comfortable about pace and speed of which things have to operate at, um, and so forth. So, um, so our professional development around our administrative professional development is really based around um, anti-racist school leadership that is becoming racially aware and develop skills to dismantle racism um, and associated oppressions within our school and community. So that's kind of our own professional development within a uh, mission within that. Um, and here are our guiding questions. What do we need to be effective as anti-racist leaders? Um, how can we best coach our staff, students, and families in creating anti-racist schools? How do we effectively support anti-racism um, subcommittee work in our policies, curriculum, instructions, and professional development? Um, and I think that's, that's where all the work is coming with the teachers and within their professional development and those different pillars of our subcommittees, I call them pillars of our subcommittees, their work they're doing is, you know, how as administrators do we support that and the obstacles that start to face those groups and, and support through that. And, and then how do we communicate and expand our work um, with our larger community? So overall, um, this is an outline of what we're doing. I'm sorry that thing keeps popping up. I'm sure you can't read for a second. Um, First is, um, you know, we in the summer we created our, our, you know, we created together our anti-racism equity subcommittee. Um, we did on October six. I think I talked about this at the lab meeting. We did have our own um, meeting with Dr. Elizabeth Pryor um, at Smith College, who talked about the use of the N word and how to, how it can be used, how it should not be used academically, and but, but how do you um, deal with the subject of the N word in the classroom? Um, you know, and allow administrators to kind of have their own side conversations with her about how do we lead and help support, um, you know, the teachers in the academic front of, of working around use of the N-word as it comes up in history and in literature and those kind of things. Um, we also talked to her about um, developing our own infrastructure of support um, as well. So it was, a, it was a great session with her. She's a wonderful person and I doubt she's watching us, but she should know that. Um, on October 26th, we did um, the REI virtual groundwater um, presentation, which basically looks at 
um, brings leaders together from across the nation to look at um, racial inequity across all systems, um, the socioeconomic differences, um, and um, the inequalities um, caused by different systems. And so it was very fascinating, the data that they presented there. And if anyone had, had thoughts of that, you know, racism is not systemic. Um, it does not have effects. If you see, if we went through that kind of net that we had to have that session to understand that, um, it was just very in your in your face kind of statistics and um, as they call it, the groundwater is understanding um, it's kind of, it's permeated everywhere. And so um, it was a great uh, meeting. And so all administrators um, took place, took part in that. There was either a morning session or an afternoon session. Um, number third, we, we um, joined the full day anti, um, the district anti-racism and equity group. Um, I know I'm reading through this, but I, I'm trying to explain it. We are also doing a book discussion uh, between the world and me. And we have two dates where we're doing half and half of the book. In January, in January, although most of us have already done it, uh, we're doing a podcast discussion of Nice White Parents. Great podcast for those who haven't heard about it, but it really talks about New York public schools and how um, good intentions sometimes are doing the opposite um, in, in bringing out change in schools. And so uh, very interesting about, you know, um, you know uh, white families um, entering schools of color um, thinking they're bringing about change when they're bringing about their own change and not not including everyone. And so it was very, very interesting um, look at that. Um, and then um, on January 22nd, the elementary school, elementary staff rather administrators are working with Sapphire, um, Dijon and um, Romania Pacheco, um, Mana Mosea and the anti-racism curriculum. So we're gonna continue it there. Um, and in February, March, we are working on um, a second book discussion, and we're this time we're going to try to get in, bring in outside facilitators to help us through that discussion. We just couldn't, we didn't want to slow the work this fall when we couldn't find um, someone to help us lead through the first one. Um, but the origins of our discontents, and we're reading through that, and then um, we're still looking for leadership workshops. This is really something I. I I'll be honest, I, try, I thought the REI was going to give us a little bit more than it did. It gave us great foundational information, but not hands-on educational leadership workshop. And so I'm still, we're going to try to fit something in there late spring. And then we're going to, we're going to take that and bring it into our May and the summer summit where we will talk about and work with our, um, our equity leadership um, in our um, subcommittees um, to figure out what does year two look like. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what we're doing there. And then um, a little bit different in the secondary, the secondary is joining on with the, the empathy consulting group from UMass, um, sorry, the, the racial empathy consulting group from UMass. Um, and there, those are the dates that they're in, in, in titles of stuff that they're working on there. So sorry to read each slide, but I know a lot of people wanted to, there's questions out there, what the administration was doing. And, you know, we were trying to put together something that meets the unique needs of um, you know, being in a position of supporting this kind of change. So, so right. mm -hmm. great work too. Thank you, Darius. All right. It's my first time going back and forth between broadcasting and sharing a screen. So you're a master. Yeah, it, oh, it worked and it worked. There is a yep. 10 second delay for those who don't know. So I have to look <laughs> and have to see if they show up. So that, that's there. And again, I, I went, I know I spoke quickly, but I did share that with all of you. Um, of what we're doing there. So, Earlier, you you questions on that? No. Okay. Ken, you're muted. I I said, are there any questions for Darius or Kelsey or Kelsey or Darius, which whichever? Um, this is great work. I I honestly think um, there's a tremendous amount of work being done. Obviously, so thank you. Thank you to everyone. <clears throat> yeah, my only closing thought is I thought it was really well said by the UMass group is that this is the this is not work that gets done in a year. It doesn't get done right. in a few months. We really have to set right. the foundation this year so that we can do long-term growth. And I think it's it's hard to slow down. You know what I mean? And, and so it's without mm -hmm. slowing down, but keeping yeah. a good pace. It's like a marathon runner. So you got to find a good pace and, and, and get there. But at first we have to get, I don't know, Get a lack of analogies here, get in shape by understanding that what we need to do to lay the groundwork moving forward. And I kind of feel like that's where we are now. Um, yeah. Very good. Thank you. So 
we will move on to snow, <laughs> a little bit of a contrast here, but snow days or remote days update. <laughs> Bye, Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Jennifer, if you both. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, great work, seriously. <clears throat> you know, snow days, I was just, it was a non-voted item in the last agenda. I just threw it on there, continue. I did, you probably got my my uh, email they sent out to everybody. Right. Um, uh, the community rather that yep. we will be having remote days for snow days unless the weather is going to predict massive power outage or kind of breakdowns of systems and so eight ten inches of snow maybe there'll be a cancellation uh, but those minor delays yep. in enclosures will be uh, remote so right okay so. thank you Votes on policy ACAB and policy BEDH. Um, policy ACAB is any discrimination and anti harassment policy and grievance procedure. The only change that was put in that is as recommended by one of the committees, we removed the names from the policy so that the policy right. can be updated every time there was change. So you'll notice that those names have been removed. Um, and correct. And on the website in a um, easy to find place for those who need to contact those people. Yes, yep. now thank you for doing that. Just having had to deal with policies over the years, it makes it easier if you don't have too many things to try and remember every year to check, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would entertain a motion on policy ACAB. Or not. Am I still muted? I would make that motion. I'll make the motion for uh, to approve the ACAB anti-discrimination, anti-harassment policy and grievance okay. procedure. I'll second that. And David second. And we'll do a roll call vote. I'm assuming no further discussion. Uh, Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? It's five yes. to nothing. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, policy BEDH public comment at school committee meetings, which I believe is as it was presented last meeting. Yeah. Um, and I think this is the. Yep, Again, I would. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I would make the um, make a motion to approve the um, policy B. EDH public comment at school committee meeting policy. Second. Is that Mary? Yep. That's yes, Mary. Mary. And uh, any other comments or thoughts? If not, roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Yeah, Trevor McDaniel. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. So we move on to new business. And uh, I think this is where Darius gets to try out his uh, presenting powers once again, the community health indicators, changes and updates. So we, uh, as you know, way back in August, we created uh, the community health indicator. We created metrics. At the time, the state, as you can just bank, take everybody back, which feels like probably six years ago, uh, where we were talking in August, where the state didn't have metrics, and we really had to have create these metrics in which, um, you know, if there was a community, what the community levels of COVID would be, and what would cause closure and such. So we created these metrics from. Remember, I was feeling them from neighboring districts, ironically that haven't opened, um, and and <laughs> sorry, bad joke. The um, and. Uh, Basically, at the same time, the state came out with metrics. And so they started coming out with their color-coded maps and that kind of thing, and their own kind of coming down from DESE about when you should be closing and when you should not be closing. So we still believe in holding to our metrics, I, our, our town boards of health. So what I did is we updated the metrics. I sent them to all the boards of health, and then they changed them on Friday. <laughs> so I believe, I mean, because Trevor's on the board of health for Deerfield, I believe, Trevor, you guys voted them on Wednesday, and we then did. they changed them they changed them on Friday. But yeah. what I did is I inserted the changes and I'll present where we are looking at the changes and kind of walking through them because we did have an instance where the metrics, we consulted the, the Board of Health, you know, where we said that they would bring us to a closure in, we'll say in Sunderland when there was an outbreak with the amount of UMass students that brought them um, 
a total of 11 cases over two weeks, which put Sunderland in the red. At the time, this happened the week of the wind, the, the night of the windstorm. You know, this the Board of Health in Sunderland met and um, decided, you know, basically looking at the information, said they don't have community spread here. This is uh, a few cases and a few um, dwellings within the community, so there was no need to shut down the schools. But it was going against. They went against the the metrics overall. It made sense. It was logical thinking, and you know um, that kind of thing. So we felt we had to change the language in there, you know, with the changes that we're getting from the state. The state has also come back. So let me, let me do my presentation here because maybe. Um, <clears throat> Yikes, get there, whoop, don't look there. Let's go to the beginning. All right, so let me go through my presentation of it. So again, we keep on putting this out there because these are the things that, that stop the transmission. Let's remember the hand, hand hygiene, the physical distancing, wear those masks and then stay home if you're ill. We gotta keep telling people that, especially with holidays coming up. Um, we can talk about that later. Anyway, this is where we're getting the key sources. Again, I sent this out to you school committees. Um, Anything that's um, highlighted is new, new, new information throughout the, pro the thing here. Um, so basically what they came out with on Friday, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, is basically they looked at communities with under 10,000 people, which you can see here, this is under 10K, and the number of cases. The way Deerfield, since this is Deerfield, we'll talk about Deerfield. The way Deerfield was set up, you could never have been green um, and you could have been yellow. So if you had a total of Gray, uh, if you had a total of five cases, you would have turned yellow. And if you had a six case, you would have turned red. So you didn't have really have a chance. So if you had six total cases in your town of, you know, how many residents are there? 6,000, 7,000, somewhere yeah. in there, Trevor? 5,500 um, or so. You know, if you had a total of, you know, uh, six cases, your town would be red. That could be one household um, or, you know, that kind of thing. And so, it, you know, it, I agree with the governor's decision here. The, the, the color scale did not work for Western mass communities. Um, right. We started looking at 100,000 people. So it kind of puts things in whether or not people agree with the total number of cases. I'm, you know, I'm not the one who put those numbers together, but at least it, the color indicators meant something where before, if you were red, it, well, it's only red if, you know, you know, one household gets it. And, you know, imagine if, if uh, Deerfield can be having yellow, all the other towns around us uh, that are part of our other district it's either red or gray. There's no green or yellow. Right. And so you just feel bad that you can't be those other colors. <sighs> Sorry. All right. So um, basically also the guidance from the state is talks about that, um, you know, you should not be going to uh, remote learning unless you are red. Our board of health doesn't completely agree with that. They want to look at case by case, how the cases are in the community. And if there's transmission that puts the schools at risk, they said that they may be shutting us down temporarily to do assessments or longer term. So, and I agree with our boards of health that we are in a position where we can um, look at the data a lot closely. Our cases are usually fortunately, and hopefully stay that way around a handful or so. And you can kind of know exactly the board of health knows this information, who those, who those cases are and how they, you know, how they, uh, how they were acquired and such, which makes a big deal about if it's community transmission or um, an incident of transmission. Um, Deerfield is the town that oversees Frontier as well. So whatever Deerfield says, Frontier has to actually follow. Their Board of Health were following as well. Um, again, the DESE is saying that you need to base closure based on three weeks of reporting. As I just said, I'm not sure we completely agree with that. I let them boards of health, you know, comment directly, but in my conversations with them, and I agree with them, we have the ability. And then we could also look at, um, you know, whether cases reflect long tier facilities or UMass or a correctional facility, which doesn't affect us, but, you know, looking about where those cases are coming from. So um, just having greater clarity there. Um, the data indicators, you know, the new change here again is I'm just going to read the new changes part is that if any any of these data thresholds are met, the district will con consult with the local board of health on the individual four town level. Um, and additional information on case count will be sought by neighboring municipalities, which we already are doing, FYI, with our school choice um, and that kind of thing. We are in conversations with our neighboring um, um, not boards of health, but the uh, the nurse the nurses in those towns. Um, that are doing the contact tracing. So Meg is doing that, that those conversations. Um, our primary indicators are still the same. And our secondary indicators, um, 
you know, 50 more cases in Franklin County, we triggered immediate consult the local board of health. Um, we didn't, we've gotten pretty close to 50 uh, two weeks ago. We were in the forties. Um, but again, none of, we didn't see a spikes in our community or anything connected to our school. So we were able to stay um, with the hybrid model open. And then mm -hmm. there's no changes here on our tertiary. I have trouble with that word indicators. And in the last few pages, I'm not going to go into big things here, but I put this out there for you is what, if what, what, uh, triggers a, a re the rapid mobile testing unit. If we did have an outbreak in a school um, or community spread, um, you can get the mobile unit to come out and do full school testing. And then in the, in the pages here after that, um, you know, talk about when there are confirmed cases of COVID in a school, fortunately we haven't had that. Um, and, you know, uh, they kind of give the indicators for that um, of what, what you need to have in order to, con to have that mobile unit come out, so. Um, so yeah, so let me stop sharing this. Yeah, Darius, could I, could I make one editorial comment on that? The second page, um, we're, we're dealing with COVID-19. I don't think you want to be dealing with mange. You have mange instead of manage on one of your bullet points. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> might want to clean that up before I'll your next presentation. Yeah, yeah. Care yeah. about the pets too here. <laughs> Yes. All right. Let's just stick to COVID nineteen, please. So. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, that those look like a pretty comprehensive uh, guidelines, and cl obviously, close contact with the LBOHs is, is going to be critical um, as we as we continue through this crazy year. So. So it, it gets into this kind of funky area of. Um, we need the local board of health to agree to these, you know, um, mm -hmm. kind of bring it through the, the school committee because we've we've determined that local board of health makes the decision to close down the schools. And where there, and this is for the public watching. The difference is the local board of health in working with the um, working with in this particular case, working with Lisa, the nurse uh, manager for the town. Um, they have the details that I'm not allowed to have, so right. they know who, what, when, where and you know how it was contracted and that kind of stuff you know they'll give us general overviews of things so sometimes they put us at ease like oh there's four cases in town we're worried about well there's a, a group of people that travel outside of state have nothing to do with the school they don't have school age children oh thank you you know that makes us feel better that kind of stuff so they give us some general overviews that but they have the, the detailed information that we don't have access to um where they should be the ones making that call and there's also there's a little bit of separation i actually like that you know, separation of um, health and state, so where we can make the decision. So, um, so I think they need, really need to approve those first. I mean, I guess you guys could agree with them, um, although you guys have already have approved this without the. You're the one committee that met this week or last week, rather. Trevor, I'm talking to you. You can't see me. Yes, yeah, yeah, Board of Health. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but we could revote them if there was a change on Friday. Um, you know, we can bring them up again and do that. It is. I mean, it's a change, but again, I know, and I, I just want to make sure because people are clear that the local boards of health, and, I, and they really should be speaking, saying this instead of me, um, in the sense that they're they see what the state is saying, but they're not. They understand the guidelines the state's putting out. But that they're not going to make their decisions based on that. They're making their decisions based on the information they have, not on color codes and numbers. You know, what I mean, because of the smaller right. numbers we've had, and there's a different expectation in our community because of the less, the, the lower numbers that we've had, that we're not going to sit back and just wait for you know, um, you know, a total, you know, community wide outbreak before. Okay, now it's we got reached the number finally. We can now close. Yeah. The, the, the board of health, you know, was clear from the beginning they're not going to do that. Um, so, okay. Good. So, thank you, Darius. Very yep. good presentation. Um, we move to, I believe, Tina and phase three hybrid planning. How exciting. This is cool. <clears throat> yeah, so um, this will answer some of your questions, Trevor, about why are you talking about all these savings and then hiring more people? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think I just want to go back and just recap that we opened with a blended model. 
And the blended model is that we have teachers that are teaching remote and hybrid at the same time. And this allowed us to think flexibly about our learning environment, our resources, and our social and emotional support that were required during this time. And it gave us time also to put our health and safety routines into place. But now we have nine weeks under us and we're constantly reflecting and adjusting. And at this point, there's two big factors why we need to kind of change. First off, the structure that we have set up, it doesn't support growth. Um, we have uh, different grade levels sharing classrooms. And so the only growth we could do to add additional uh, days and service our vulnerable learners would be every other day on Wednesday. The other piece on this is um, it's not sustainable for educators. Uh, it's, it's overwhelming to juggle the two educational models at the same time. So we're really looking to make a shift. Um, it's a good time to make the shift. We're looking at a trimester uh, switch coming up. We're um, hoping to get students in you know, around December 7th and into January 4th. I've been in constant conversation with the faculty and staff. They're involved in the process all the way. Um, actually, I just came off. Jen was in the last meeting with me. I think I had six, me six hours worth of meetings straight today with um, faculty and staff and small groups getting feedback. So we're really looking at um, developing a remote classroom for our remote learners and bringing students in by January 4th, four days a week to service our vulnerable learners. And um, also provide some continuity for educating the staff in person, or the, the students in person and remote. Because right now with the model that we have, there's a lot of interruptions with um, moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. We also have about 72% of our students are back and every week we see two to three students that are transitioning from remote to hybrid and we're at a point where now our remote students can be serviced by our remote staff okay let's go in order let's to continue. do that to go in by the into instructional assistance i didn't even answer that question um in order to do that we're really looking to have um in, the IAs in each classroom supporting the teachers in person with the health and safety routines and along with our social um, or, or supports for students. And we also have a two cohort. We, we don't want um, any staff right now are not able to mix uh, with classrooms, so more than two classrooms. And so in order to support students and in order to support the health and safety routines, we would need four additional staff to have two in each room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good problem to have. I like I like to hear that, you know, getting kids back is really important. They really need it, especially at the younger ages. So could you just, Tina, maybe provide an an overview of how how things are, you know, functioning? Are you, I, I mean obviously you we're moving forward and you're you're going through these proposed you know, looking at the proposed changes, but do things feel like they've settled into routines in the school? Um, you know, are the precautions being followed, et cetera? You know, yeah, how, how think, is everything working? <laughs> yeah, everything seems to be going very smoothly. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think. We have very, our, our waiting room gets some use, if you will, because we're, if, if there's a student that has any symptoms, they're sent to the waiting room. Um, People are, are following all of the precautions. Students, we do have some, recess time is hard with the younger students, but we have routines in place for that. Kindergarten is actually coming back four days a week on November 30th. Uh, they are really our vulnerable population. And I think with our schedule, we have almost like an every other day schedule. It's hard for the younger kids to build those routines in. And so getting them in four days a week is actually gonna help support some of those health and safety routines with the younger students. Um, students are, they, they are resilient. They're um, mask wearers, like you wouldn't believe. They, they uh, you know, we'll, we'll point it out if, if we're not doing something that's appropriate. I was just near a student, maybe five and a half feet and back up, it's a six foot <laughs> just at social distance. So, you know, they're very, they're aware of everything as well. Um, I think teachers are falling into, I mean, Jen's here, and if she wanted to speak to that, although she wasn't on for that, uh, teachers are following, falling into a routine, but having the mixed model is um, hard. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's difficult to support, but we want them back, and we can't support the vulnerable learners like we would want to. There's just no space yeah. or, or um, staff that are available, so... You know, we're, we're really looking forward. All of my meetings that I had with teachers uh, the past two days are in support of getting the, the students back in the four days a week as well. So. Right. 
I think uh, one of the questions I, I'll say it for everybody else out there, the elephant in the room is like, really? You guys are starting to plan as rates are going up in the state? Um, you know, but I think that, you know, I'm hoping the rates will come down by the time we, in the, in the area at least, will come down by the time um, this plan rolls out. But I think that the, you know, the the risk that the, the safety protocols that we have in place really do bring down transmission. They're seeing that across the state in schools. They're not seeing schools as big outbreak places um, because of that we have these kind of things in place. And, you know, it doesn't mean, so, there, you know, do we increase risk by having students more each day in the building? Well, certainly anytime you increase that kind of thing, but I don't know if it's exponentially compared to, um, I think that we're able to keep people safe um, in the model that we are. And if it's unsafe, we should be shutting down. You know what I mean? That kind of thing um, and going to the remote model, just as we did originally. And we have to continue to plan moving forward. And um, we've been concerned as administrators, and Tina mentioned it, about the teaching staff. The model that we built and unrolled rolled out, you know, was to get it going. And it really, you know, it was it was really burning. I don't think the teachers could do it a year long. They really couldn't. Um, it, was asking, it was asking too much. Um, Trying to Jennifer has kind of a glazed look, so <laughs> um, it was. It's, it was. It's you know. It's you. Know, we said, oh, it'll get better, you know, and it probably got a little bit easier as routines got in. But still, it's a, it's a model where you're doing two different models, and you're you're working with students here, and you're doing this here, um, and I'm not sure everybody's winning. I mean, there's going to be some of the down uh, changes within the model. Tina is that. You know, is there any concerns that you have within the changes with it with it? Yes. So um, one of the changes is with our remote. So moving st forward, students who continue in the remote will have new classrooms and um, will not have their same classroom teacher. They, they will have a as as we're planning, they will have a familiar support staff or teacher, but they will not have the same classroom teacher. If they do trans ba transition back from remote to hybrid, they um, will possibly go back into the same classroom. There's a, a very few, depending upon um, <laughs> space in classrooms, where students may not drop back into the original home room classrooms. So that is the the only disappointment, I guess, we would have with moving to this new model. Okay. But as you said, the flip side is that the, the, those students who are remote at and the, the other half of the class is in person or you know what I mean there's a they're losing time because there's mask breaks and there's those kind of things and, and they, yes they need breaks at home but it's a little bit different where they're they're not part of that that group right. as you mentioned earlier and they they endure a lot of disruptions too as students kind of phase into the remote and out of the remote or the teachers trying to kind of figure out the technology um, so there's a lot of disruptions that happen with the remote learners um, as well. Can I ask a question? Um, um, can you just explain, I guess I didn't quite catch it, about like the, this new model, how much more in-person teaching is there going to be? I heard you say kindergarten is going back four days. So right now we have our LEAP program that's going back four days and kindergarten on November 30th. And then we're looking at either a December 7th start date for all students to come back four days a week if they choose hybrid or a staggered start. I'm working with faculty now on that where half of the building by wing, um, one grade level or um, in each wing would come back on December 7th and then the second half would come back on January 4th. So we're talking about four days of in-person we're trying to protect our Wednesday times because that's a time where teachers can really collaborate with each other. Our remote teachers can collaborate with our um, in-person teachers, if you will. So we're trying to protect that time. Yeah. Thanks, great. I, I just heard the kindergarten and I didn't catch all, all the rest of it. And then um, is there a worry? Did, are you saying something like you're, some remote learners, if they wanted to come back, may not be able to because of space? Are we going to refuse anybody because of space concerns? No, I'm sorry if that's what I communicated. I'm just saying that they may not be able to trans transition back into their originally assigned classrooms. Um, okay. We will more than likely be able to make that accommodation. <laughs> okay. It, that would just be if everybody was to come back at this moment in time where we needed to keep six feet um, distance with some of the spacing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think we're, and that's important what Tina's saying is we're bringing the students back, but we're not changing our spacing. So you're still talking about six feet spacing and, you know, that, you know, those kind of things. So you can, David, you're bringing up a good point is what if everybody wants to come back? Okay. Let's just, let's just play that game. We would have a problem. Yeah. And so, so we, you know, and so that would, right, Tina, to, to some level, what that problem yeah, would be? Yeah, there's one grade. So what we did is we looked at classrooms. And if everybody was to come back and that classroom was to have 16 students or less, they have one space. If everybody was to come back in that classroom and they have 17 students or more, they have two classrooms. So this allowed us to kind of spread out with the building and bring every classroom back in. There is one classroom and one grade level that has one class. And if everybody was to come back in that class, they would have 17. Um, so I would have to take that one student and put them into a different grade level classroom, but we can support every student coming back at this point. There's just one student in one grade that might not be able to go back to the classroom if everybody was to come back. And it's my kid, isn't it? You're not gonna <laughs> it is. <laughs> Already <Come> designated. <laughs> Um, and you said that there's 72%, was your number 72% of the student population is is I, what? Yeah, I think, we're, I know we're at, at definitely at 70. Um, I, we, I think we're 72% of our total population that are um, back in person or chose the hybrid model. Chose the hybrid. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, so... This is this is and great. Another, another question, sorry. Is the six yes. foot the six foot thing is our um, self-imposed, or did the state change their guidance to six feet from the original sort of three? The state, the the CD, I believe it's I want to make sure I don't want to quote the wrong place. Where's Meg Birch when I hear? But the CDC I think came out with six feet, and then the state came out with three to three feet, three to six feet. And we said, you know, um, and working with, you know, you know these moving numbers that we're going to go with the more conservative one. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to go with the six feet. And um, that's how we are moving forward. It's also part of, I think in our agreement, you're working with teachers, you know, um, we, the teachers have to feel comfortable with, with what we're planning moving forward for safety parameters. And we're sticking with that six feet. So um, that's, that's where we are at this time, David. Okay. But we're not, are we, are you saying we would let that get in the way of somebody who wants to come back? If we only have um, one, Six feet won't get in the way of actually keeping them further away, but the, <laughs> no. But you're, yes, you're right. So if a classroom seating for six feet only allows sixteen students, we're not going to put a seventeen student in that room and then have four and a half feet for two students in there, because this is what we've agreed to be our parameters. Because you start, the idea is we have our safety parameters. Either we're, we believe in them or we don't. And so yeah. the idea is we would move that student to a different section, um, where you could have better spacing. And so, and I, and I imagine that particular student out there, everybody's figuring out, who's that student? Um, it could be any student, and maybe it could even be a student that maybe you want to change. You, you know, you, sometimes you yeah. can, sometimes things fall into your own, where a parent would be like, hey, I'll, I'll elect to move my kid. I'm not, things aren't working out great, or they would love a new start, or, you know, that kind of, their friends in the other class, you know, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's not always a, a bad scenario. Sometimes good things come of that. Yeah. Okay. And so, just by curiosity, is this what the all the Union 38? folks are doing or are, are the schools on different programs and trajectories? God, David, what do you think? Uh, I'm just curious. Um, yes, very, that's a very good question though. So basically what happened is, so looking at phase three, I met with the principals and I basically said, maybe was it three weeks ago? I said, gang, we got to start planning what, because they were just getting, they were just starting to catch their breath and they're not looking so exhausted every day. So I said, listen, you guys, now we got to look at we got to start building phase three model. And I said, so what I want you to do is I go, we're going to, we're going to go through Thanksgiving. Um, you know, that, that was just about when that time of that calendar went out. I said, after that, we got to start thinking about what does our next phase look like? And I said, I want you to go back. What can you possibly do? And then start working with your staffs to do. The problem is within our 38 district, every building is different and you really to a one size fit all model doesn't work. Um, and when you talk about communities like Conway, they've already have a lot of their classes back four days a week because the size of their classes, they're not dealing right. with, you're talking about 120 students where, you know, you know, Deerfield's closer to 400 students. You know what I mean? It's just a very different problem where you have classes where you have multiple teachers at each grade level in some buildings, you have multiple teachers at each grade level. 
And then in other, our smaller town schools, you have one teacher per grade level. So it just doesn't look the same. So we really um, sent, the, 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 I kind of put each principal on the spot to go back and come up with a plan that, you know, their school can do. And what does it look like? And what is the timing of it? You know, what's the level of comfort? And then that's what's happening right now. So I would say in an honest reporting factor, I know Tina was kind of been working some late hours recently on this um, and kind of doing some hurry up offense with the, with the um, teaching staff. I mean, this is really should probably be reported next week. Would you agree, mm -hmm. Tina? You're still in conversations about talking about sure. getting this feedback. Is it a is it a slow roll? Is it a, a phase rollout? Is it all coming out and get, making sure people's voices get heard? So, again, we're building this. It's not a top down initiative. It's building mm -hmm. from the teachers. The idea that um, I think there's a common sense that, that we need to adjust the model and getting to more students back in person. If we can safely do it, we should be doing so. I think this is actually timely for this meeting, Darius, because we finished. I finished up with all my grade level meetings today. We had a faculty meeting last Friday, I think, um, and there's been a question and answer sheet out. So a lot of the groundwork has been laid. There's a survey out now asking um, faculty and staff to kind of weigh in about when to start it. So it's good to get it kind of out for now. Great. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds wonderful. I mean, it's great to hear, yes. frankly. I'm so. sure it took a lot of work, so. <laughs> Just a little. So, so, the, the, so do the, we need a vote? That's exactly the good question, Mr. Ken. Um, <laughs> the, um, so the question is, I don't know. I've never had to do phase changes in the middle of a pandemic. So, um, you know what I mean? Like there's no, so I was talking with other other superintendents. They said, well, let the school committee make the decision on that. But the other side of me is like, you know, we've already, you know, timing wise, we don't know exactly if it's going to be a phase one out or not. I guess maybe a vote of endorsement moving forward, and then you can vote it at the next meeting, which may, when's the next meeting? Someone? Next month. I know. Is it, <laughs> is it after the 7th? Month. Um, I don't have my calendar up. I, I just don't want to use the one that's sharing my screen because everybody would see my private calendar. They know when I get my hair done. Um, the <laughs> next school committee meeting is the 8th, so it would be after the start of it. So I guess they... <clears throat> I guess a, 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 well, a vote of support to move forward this, on this. this just hang on a second, Trevor. Sorry. Hang on one second, Trevor. I just want to make sure we. Uh, my, my question was as much related to: Do we want a vote on the four IAs and the use of school choice funds? I forgot about that part. In order to do. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I don't know. I don't know if Shelly and Tina talked about that. that's how we'll, we'll, we'll lay it out. Shelly will kind of give you the bad news really early and you'll forget about it. So <laughs> in order to get the proper coverage and do the, the fact that we have, do have staff members working remotely, um, in order to get the coverage, we're going to need to hire, Tina, why don't you jump in and explain what those are again so that people have an understanding. So we need four additional um support staff or um, instructional assistance for in-person to support the health and safety routines of in-person and also some student support in, um, within the classrooms. So, okay. So my, my thought would be that we would make a motion to um, support the continued move towards phase three planning and uh, the request for, for potentially four additional instructional assistant positions to be paid for out of school choice funds. I'll second that, that motion. Does that sound good to people? Yes. Or any questions or concerns? I'm good. Okay, now I just have to remember what I said, but that's okay, I'll write it up. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchels? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. <clears throat> and Trevor McDaniel? Yes. Um, just, it. it's wonderful to, thank you, that's unanimous. It's wonderful to, uh, be able to support Tina and her team and the faculty. Um, and it's exciting to have us considering the move to phase three. And, you know, we, we continue to 
to move along in this crazy year. So thank you, Tina, for the hard work. Tell your staff and team, thank you as well. Jennifer, I'm sure can pass the word along as well. So thank you. Thank, thank you for your support and it's all them. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I think you have a little bit to do with it, Tina. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we're on to capital planning 2021. 22. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Got the motorcycle there, David. All right. Um, the uh, uh, Main Street North Hand. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there we are. All right. So the uh, I'm going to share my screen again. All right. Um, I did share with you probably right before the meeting the um, my workbook for Capital. It does have tabs on the bottom by school. So please click, click the appropriate tab. Um, and this is a draft of this year's, um, let me do present now and Shelly, you be ready to jump in and help me out here, okay? Um, your entire screen. And let me go to Deerfield. Okay. So, um, let me kind of walk you through. We've, we've changed this. Uh, you probably looked at this last year. Um, we did change the uh, format slightly. Um, whereas when you're looking at it there, we have our projects. We talked about the priority. We start talking about which ones are completed, which one are in progress. Um, and as you go left, I'm just kind of showing you, um, you know, Shelly put this together because she's great. Um, she didn't put it together because she is great. She put it together and she's great. Um, our estimated costs here, mm -hmm. under the quotes, some any kind of notes we're talking about, the vendor if necessary, what year we requested the money, what year was funded, the approved amount, the actual spending, and the remaining funds. So um, sorry those of you at home, you can't get to see all that, but those of you on the school committee can, can kind of go through that doc. So basically we talked about what's been completed and I think it's important that we show, I think that's a big part of our, um, um, a big part of our communication around capital planning uh, that has been, you know, that Shelly and I have started last year is that we also want to show like, where's people's money been going? You know, didn't we just do that? I thought, you know, you people are, you know, you, you hear that at town meetings and stuff. I thought we just paid for something like that. And so, you know, that kind of thing. So just being very transparent about what's been completed, what's, you know, we can see here what's in progress. And then what we've done in, this is similar to last year, we've rated things one, two, and three. One meaning we would like you to consider that for this year. Um, I also know this is going to be a very difficult year financially for all the towns. Um, and I don't know how it's going to affect capital improvements, but I think we still have to show where we think our number one issues are and then let the capital improvement um, committee in town, as, as it relates to Deerfield, has its own capital committee, um, look at that and um, say, what should we do and not do? So looking at what we're looking at for this year, um, you know, going right to the blue, number 18 there. Um, we have eight we have, we have eight in, do, uh, door entrance carpets that need to be replaced. That really is a low number for a capital improvement. Um, usually you want it to be over 5,000. So I would not be surprised if you were to say to me tonight, you know, Darius, we're gonna have to find another way to fund that. But I wanna say it's just, it gets a little bit higher than our maintenance budget can handle. Um, and Shelly, jump in if I misspeak on anything, all right? I can't mm -hmm. see anybody's faces because my screen is presenting. No, um, I think you said that exactly right. Okay. So it's just kind of pushing up there about it takes a lot of the general fund. So maybe, we, you know, I don't know if we combine it with the flooring or something like that. That can Continue our three classrooms of flooring at 6,000 a piece. Um, we have projection. What are those, you know, what those rooms will be um, moving forward. Um, and then the restroom upgrades, we're continuing that project as well. Um, and this, this time it's the five, six wing, um, Good. new partitions and new floorings there as well. So, and then you can see the cost there. The generator we left on there, um, Bill wants everybody to know, Bill Hilder for our facilities minute, a director wants everybody to know if we had that generator, we wouldn't have had to cancel school. <laughs> after the windstorm but it was a good point made like when you know, the question was last when's the last time the school lost power it was there but um you know I, I didn't know i can't i don't remember where it ended up last year and i'm fine again this is not something the school is pressing as much as it's a town building i just want to make sure the right. town makes the decision on that is what they what they want to do 
Um, yep. Trevor, I'll say it out loud to you because it I thought it was going to happen last year, um, but I want to replace the chain link yeah. fence around the playground of the that that softball field. It's almost getting to the point where it's dangerous. Yeah. Um, and thing would be perfect there because to be honest with you, I think the town wrecks the park <clears throat> that field more than the school does. Yeah. Yes. No, it's definitely. And I think um, I know Bill left me a message on that. I haven't been able to bring him back. And I, I mentioned that um, I don't think I want to wait for CPA funding. I might ask for a um, reserve transfer this year to, to just see if I could get that from the finance committee to just get that done. It's a real safety issue. It's not a lot of money, um, but, you know, I, I don't want a kid's eye coming out, coming around that corner. There's, there's, you know, wires hanging out there. It's just not safe. So, yeah. um, so I'll, I'll talk to them as soon as they meet again and um, put a request in for that to get that done sooner rather than later. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great. Yeah, to, I, mean, I mean, it'd be great. I mean, if we have spring athletics as normal, I mean, I mean, everything's, uh, I gotta tell you that, you know, with the Pfizer thing coming out, it, it does help us out a great deal in the sense that we can probably start planning for some normalcy maybe as early as spring. So um, that's great Trevor, that you'd look at that. Yep. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Uh, and, and, um, and then I guess just kind of discussing what number twos are, just so that people, um, people, just so that you guys are aware, um, uh, you know, some of our things that, you know, really aren't for this year, maybe they're the following year or two years out, depending on, um, and I, and I always kind of throw out there to everyone, things can go from a three to one if they break, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Things can go from not on the list to a one if they break. Um, and so that we, we reserve the right to update the list, and so do you reserve the right to update the list to the public that's watching. Um, so um, just basically the, um, the restroom upgrades continuing there. The courtyard upgrades, um, the injury courtyard, um, you know, we're looking at a grant in progress for replacing the asphalt there in, in, in those, those bushes. Um, the bushes that are around the building need to be cut away um, and, you know, the roots removed and replanted. Um, they're actually getting to the mm -hmm. point where they are a hazard where stu students or non-students can hide in them and then play a nice game of hide and go seek when we don't want them to. Um, and, yep. and there's even some that have nice berries on them that they really shouldn't have. Um, flooring upgrades, um, that's a continuation of the, those of our kind of annual expenses. So that would be, um, we're showing those in the years to come and then replace the acoustic ceiling tiles in the cafeteria. Um, and I don't know, Tina, do you know why that's being replaced? Are they just filthy? Yeah, that? that's the my understanding. That it's just, yeah, that they've just been there since 1992, I think, and they're dirty and ready to be replaced. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Because um, the way they hang down, I believe they're dust collectors and yeah, it's, um, uh, it might be it's cheaper a, to replace them than to clean them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's... <clears throat> so, and then I think okay. the new thing, the new thing on the list, Tina, is that a new one that looks new to me to replace the faucets in the classroom sinks? Is there, are they starting to drip or something? Yeah, I think that was on the list as of last year as well, though. I think it's just it's still on there. So, and that is probably one of those items similar to the entryway rugs that Darius talked about that the the cost is probably really not going to turn out to be a capital expense, but at the same time, you know, if it's three, four thousand dollars in a twenty thousand dollar building repair budget, where seven thousand immediately goes to maintenance of the energy management system, it doesn't leave a whole lot of money left for these larger projects. So, just something to think about: of do we use a, a different funding source to pay for some of those things that need to be done, even though they're not capital? Okay. I'm wondering if maybe you could take something like the ref the faucets and the flooring, the the entry door entry flooring, and combine them into one, and call it a project. Um, because as you say, these are it's just something that we can't fit into the regular budget. So maybe <clears throat> the way to get it considered is. Um, capital improvement is to combine them into into a joint into a joint project request what do you think trevor yes yeah i do um okay we, we can we can yeah, certainly yeah, up, uh, yeah, i agree 
we can up that put that in as a one yeah uh, just put those mm -hmm. two together and and uh approach it that way i think it would work or at least i could present it to the committee to the capital planning committee and take it from there so we, what we yeah. need to do is we need to get a number yeah. there though so um, we'll get you a number there and get that updated um and again this sure. is a you guys don't have access to change any of the numbers here but it is a live document that we're using right. for our planning so um just know that so as we update it you'll get some updates there too um that's that's a great document. So, Ken, I just want to make sure we're clear on this. I did receive um, I did receive from the town um, the capital planning sheets. Are you going to fill them out? <laughs> I can I can give it a shot. I fill them out. No, the, sure. I think last year you said you were going to do it, and then it was actually this confusion. The only reason I bring it up because it was confusion. I believe there was confusion last year. We were in transition last year, so I filled out to get us through mm -hmm. the um, capital planning committee. All right. Um, I, I mean, I don't mind filling out forms. Um, I'm filling them out. You were the only district that filled them out for me. <laughs> right. You got kudos for that. Um, but um, I can certainly do it again. I can give it a shot. And what I tried to do was fill them out and then send them back to you and Bill and let you guys make the final notations or you and Shelly and the, the three of you. Let's do it the other way. Let me, let me fill them out. I'll send them to you. That way you don't have to send them to me. Then I send them back to you. It's actually, and then okay. you can just, mm -hmm. you can be the editor on them in the end. So. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but this list is great. Yes, very helpful. And I would just throw out one thing, Darius, Shelley, and um, Tina, just in the back of your minds, as you look at chain link fences, um, standing out in the middle, well, and right in center field is a rather large detention area or, you know, uh, detention pond that I don't think has ever had a drop of water in it. And I think um, some of the changes in DEP regulations and other things, it might be possible to re-engineer and fill that in and level the field out. Um, but, you know, that's just down the road, something to possibly consider is could we get a price or, you know, a quote on what it might cost to engineer or if it's even feasible to consider that change? Because it, I think it would, unless, unless the kids really like sliding on the side slopes and everything else, um, I think it might make a better play area out there if we had didn't have that darn pitch uh, starting in approximately right center field moving to you know right over to the stream bed so just a thought <clears throat> my my quiet i would have to know how much are we using it and by adding that space does it give us um you know, does it give us worthwhile space that we need? And I guess, you know, Tina, right. you, can, you can think about that. You don't have to get the answer now, but we can think about it and go out and look at it. It's, it's just a thought. All right, I'll stop sharing the screen so people okay. can see our faces again. I forget about that. <clears throat> and did, do we have that file? Or was that in our packet? Yep. What's that? I okay, I missed, there, I missed missed that one. <laughs> so. Great, because I can add that. I, <clears throat> West. I need to add it to the documents. Okay, so we are, um, while we're at this stage, do we want to, are we going to executive session tonight? Nope, not unless you okay. want to. Okay, so then we are down to reports. And uh, committee chair does not have anything. Um, Carrie, I think, sent us the summary report. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Carrie, or on the collaborative? Okay. Yeah, no, no. Principal's report, we all received your document. I don't know if you want to talk any more tonight, Tina, or you're done. I'm done. Uh, everything's on there. I just included some pictures of the sixth grade gift that was installed. So I sent it, re -sent it out to you guys um, tonight to nice. you get that. Yeah, that was it, it's cute to see. Where where is it installed? I, I couldn't quite figure out. 
the bear is installed out front on the um, entry area. Okay. Right, right up on that ledge. And then the mm -hmm. bench is to the right of the front entry. Right. Okay. Great. Great. <laughs> a wonderful addition. And hopefully a non-threatening, well, no, a bear can be threatening, so never mind. <laughs> but it is, it's great to have the, the symbol there. Um, superintendent also mailed us, uh, emailed us uh, thoughts earlier in the day. Do you have anything more to say to this well, evening, Gary? I've said enough, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Make that motion or second. Oh, David's trying to say something. Are you are you trying to say something, David? You're muted. Dave. Sorry, I know everyone wants to go, so we can go. But I just it, the last thing in the packet around our school population. Um, I just it just stuck out that it's down at like three eleven. And I have a feeling in the middle of last year, we were up at about 380, 390. Yeah. I'm not sure if our numbers are off, but I just, do we need to have, a, I, I guess, just curious whether you think we lost a ton of kids this year because of um, the COVID and the remote hybrid thing or, or what? So two well, things well, I just also want to highlight on that is we're yeah. down to two kindergarten classrooms from three because of the enrollment numbers and we didn't really um, accept school choice because typically we, we add more school choice in there. And the other thing is we drop from three preschools to, to one. So those are also right. in those numbers for reduction. Right. right. Okay. Additionally, the a number of homeschooling families that chose to pull completely from the school to do homeschooling because they didn't want to do the remote um, education. We doubled as a, overall as a district, we had around, um, 30 and change number of homeschooling students around across the whole district. Now we have around um, close to 80 um, students who are homeschooling families, which, you know, they don't want to do the remote um, on screen option. Right. Okay. So yeah. I'm hoping they'll come back because I think some of it was that they, you know, they're anti, maybe anti screen, you know, there's long, long days or, you know, the, they're able to, maybe they're at home, they're able to do their own programming due to COVID. Um, I, I don't know. There's different reasons for each one. So hopefully some of them, I think, I mean, I imagine we'll get, I think we'll get a lot of them back. Um, but so maybe it's just a, more of an interesting discussion in the spring, I guess, but I just flagged it. It just struck me. Yeah, the good yeah. point you bring up, David, is that, um, is that we the school choice entry point because we didn't accept school choice in those lower grades this year because you know we were this COVID model where we couldn't we weren't going to accept a bunch of school choice and then have this kind of mixed model that is kind of the entry point so it'll be interesting if next year let's just assume let's assume best things moving yeah. forward and um, you know will people who wanted to enroll in kindergarten now enroll in first grade had they never stepped foot in Deerfield for school choice. Mm -hmm. You know, where people usually try to do their whole, whatever their programming yeah. is in one. That's usually where we, as you know, we get stragglers mm -hmm. in, in the other grade levels, but we get the majority of people coming in and start their way through as part of our programming. Um, so that'll be interesting to see what that happens. It'll also be interesting what happens when we don't have the students in for preschool and the numbers that we've had in the past right. and how that affects things. So there is uncertainty in population numbers. It's yep. so a reminder about kindergarten too. We didn't um, want to accept school choice because of the social distancing factor. And if we took too many right. school choice students in, we'd have to open up a whole other classroom. Right. We, we weren't sure how many students we were going to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. No. Okay. Just a big drop. So. Thank you, David, for that question and observation. Um, anything else? If not, we'll. I'll try again for a motion to adjourn. Sorry. Motion to Don't adjourn. Sorry. <laughs> Trevor, we have a second. Motion. Was that David? Um, roll call vote. Ken, yes. And David? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Mary? Yes. Trevor? Yes. Good night, everyone. Thank you for uh, doing. It's uh, five to nothing.
Five zero, we are adjourned. I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving season, and uh, hopefully, we all have a wonderful, safe start to the holiday season.